Good morning, friends. I sent out an email earlier this week, if you get our emails, and it had um, statistics from uh, this company called Barna Research, and they, uh, they, they do a lot of polling and questions, and uh, they, they were doing a statistic, um, or sorry, a study on Christianity in America, and they were looking particularly at Gen Z um, and millennials. And they found that one of the, the leading barriers for Gen Z and millennials in, in identifying as Christians or going to church is this issue of God and suffering. And, and a lot of the Gen Z and millennials, they, they say, hey, if God is good, if you believe in a good God, why does, why does bad stuff happen all the time? And specifically, this question I want to get into this morning is, is you and I, we say, hey, I, we're Christians. We believe in God. We believe God loves us. Why is it then that God allows bad stuff to happen to us? Because certainly we've all been there. Certainly we've all been in times of suffering and, and, and sadness and bad stuff happens to us. Why does God allow that? Why does God allow that in your life? Why does that God allow that in my life? And then specifically, where is God in the midst of that? Did he forget about us? Is he trying to teach us a lesson? Is it a punishment? Why does God allow it in our lives? And where is God in the midst of our suffering? So I want to turn to uh, Psalm 77. That's what we're going to be reading out of today. And so if you would turn there with me, Psalm 77, and we're going to start here in verse 1. And this is what it says. It says, I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me. When I was in distress, I sought the Lord. At night, I stretched out on tiring hands, and I would not be comforted. So we have this, uh, this poetic imagery that's all throughout the Psalms. But specifically in this Psalm, we have this image of, of the author's hands reaching out to God unable to find comfort, unable to find peace, unable to find God. And it's a really important poetic image because the author's going to come back to that. But this psalm, it begins with, with a lament, with sadness. And this categorizes the psalm as a lament psalm. 60% of the psalms that we have in the book of Psalms um, are in this category of lament psalms. And I believe that the reason that 60% that of the Psalms are sadness and anguish and sorrow and crying out to God, I believe the reason that the majority of the Psalms are like this, lament Psalms, is because God wants to give us a way to address him in our sorrow. God wants to show us what it looks like to bring our sadness and our hurt to him. I think it's easy to praise God when times are good, when we're happy. It comes naturally. Right, to sing these songs up here, to, to raise our hands. When God is doing good things in our life, praise is a natural response. But when God is seemingly absent, when life is really hard, when you find yourself in the midst of great sadness, that's when it's really challenging to worship. That's when it's really challenging to even come to God. Now, we've all been there. We've all had those times. If you could think of those times when you've just been in the pit, whether it's a health circumstance, whether it's a relationship issue, whether it's something going on at work, whether it's loss, we, we experience sadness often. There was this article I was reading that said three days a month, the average American will spend three days a month sad. And, and this article was interesting. It, it made a, a, a correlation between four things and sadness. And it says that people who don't exercise as much tend to be more sad. People who binge drink tend to be more sad. People who smoke tend to be more sad. And then the last one, the fourth one, it's funny. People who don't wear their seatbelts tend to be more sad. And it's, uh, it's, it's correlation. It's not causation, right? But, uh, but hey, if you learn anything, next time you're sad, just uh, buckle your seatbelt. And uh, that should solve everything, according to this article. But I thought it was interesting. Uh, three days a month is, is, tends to be the average in which um, we're sad. Uh, the point is, we've all been sad before, and we're all going to be sad again. We're going to find ourselves in these positions where we're crying out, God, why? And sometimes we're just a little bit upset. Sometimes we're just having a bad day. But sometimes we, we really are upset. We're really hurt. We feel betrayed. We feel lost. We feel confused. What do we do in the midst of that? How do we come to God in, in our real hurt when things are really bad? When it's more than just a day, sometimes this goes on for a few weeks. What do we do in the midst of that as Christians? Believing in the God who loves us and cares for us, a God who wants us to be full of joy. How do we bring that to him? So I want to read on in the psalm because I believe that these lament psalms show us how to bring our sadness to God, how to bring our grief and our hurt and our confusion to God. 
And so let's read on and see what the author has to say here. Verse 3 of 77 says this, I remembered you, God, and I groaned. I meditated and my spirit grew faint. You kept from my, my eyes from closing. I was too troubled to speak. So even in turning to God, the author is still sad. And this is an, an important point to make. There will be times, uh, most times, in our sadness, in our hurt, that we turn to God and then we get silence. And that silence is deafening, especially when we're really hurting, when we're really confused, when we need God more than ever, and we say, Lord, I need you, please. And then we get nothing. That's when it's challenging. That's when it's really difficult. But you see, this is often how God steps into grief with us. God wants us to be still in the midst of our hurt. We want the quick fix. We want it to be done immediately. We want to turn to God and say, God, I'm hurting. This happened. This is, this is happening. And I want you to fix it because I hate the way I feel. I hate what's happening to me. I don't want to feel this way. And we say, God, help me. And then nothing happens. Growing up, my brother, uh, my brother stepped on a bee in the yard one time. He got the stinger stuck in his foot. He was freaking out. Never been stung by a bee before. And, uh, and it hurt, so he's yelling. But then we looked down and he saw the bee in his foot. Uh, that freaked him out even more. He didn't want to touch it, uh, but he wanted it gone. So he's, he's yelling to, to my mom. And my mom comes out and she gets her credit card. And you're supposed to get a credit card and, and like push against the skin and pop the stinger out. And she starts pressing um, on his foot. And then he like smacks her hand away. He's like, stop, 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 because it hurts, right? It hurts more as you press on it. And he's screaming. She's like, we need to get it out. And he's like, no, don't touch my foot. And this is like one of those memories. Every time we get together as a family, we always, we always laugh at this one. And, uh, and my brother, he was freaking out, but he would not let my mom near him. And he actually started hopping away from her on one foot because he was so afraid of her pushing with that credit card. Now, my mom knew that she needed to get that credit card on there and squeeze the stinger out. But my brother was so afraid of that pain because the first time she pressed it hurt, it made it worse, that he wouldn't let her near and so he spent five minutes just sitting there yelling and pushing my mom and saying, stay away from me, stay away from me. And, and I, I think of this passage, I think of, of our grief, because oftentimes when we're hurting, God says, okay, let's, let's address this. But we don't want, we, we don't want God to, to sit in the grief with us and go through it with us. We just want it gone. We want the quick fix. And many people in their hurt, in their sadness, they'll, they'll turn to drinking or they'll turn to sleeping around. Or, or they'll look for the quick fix. They'll turn to a re relationship they know that's not good for them. And what are the things you do when you're hurt? What are you drawn to? What are the areas where you know that maybe you shouldn't be doing this, but you're hurting and you, you, you don't really care because of the way you feel. And so I, I don't care about God. I'm just going to do this because I just want the pain to go away. We try and distract ourselves. And maybe it's not even anything bad. Maybe we just drown ourselves in work. Whatever it is, we, we have a tendency to want the pain to go away, and so we go for the quick fix. But God says there is no quick fix to your hurt. God says, I want you to be still in your hurt. I want you to be still in your suffering, and I want you to allow me to do my work. And it's going to be painful. It hurts to get that bee stinger out, but that's what needs to be done. We need to learn to be still in the midst of our grief, in the midst of our sorrow, and say, God, what are you doing? We need to stay engaged with God. But what does that look like? In the midst of our hurting and our sadness, what does it look like to stay engaged and to bring it with God? We've probably heard that before, right? When you're hurting, bring it all to God. Just lay it at the feet of Jesus. And that sounds nice, but what does that mean? When you find yourself in, in a confusing and painful time, what does it mean to bring that to God? The psalm continues, and we get a picture of this. Verse 5, it says this, I thought about the former days, the years of long ago. I remembered my songs in the night. My heart meditated, and my spirit asked, will the Lord reject forever? Will he never show his favor again? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has his promise failed for all time? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he in anger withheld his compassion now, this is what it looks like to stick with God in difficult times. 
the author is taking their hurt, their confusion, their anger, and they're saying, okay, God, I'm going to stick with you. I'm going to be still with you. I'm going to take my hurt to you. But what this does is this, this begins to direct that anger and that confusion and that hurt towards God. And we see it turn into questioning God. And, and at first read, it might be like, whoa, like a, is that okay? Can we be mad at God? But I think this is a good example of what it really means to be real with God. Because in times of hurting, when things are going really bad, this is how we feel. The author is being real, and I think God wants us in our suffering, in our pain, in our confusion, to be real with him. God wants us to take our doubt, our anger, and give it to him. God can take it. See, the worst thing that we can do in our pain is not be mad at God. In fact, I think God at times wants that because that's real. The worst thing we can do is just disengage, is to say, okay, God, I'm, I'm done, and to turn to other things. In our hurt and our suffering, God wants us to stay with him, but oftentimes that will, that will turn into a little bit of a, of a wrestling match with God as we bring our hurt and our frustration towards him. But it's okay to be mad at God. God can take it. There's this passage in the book of, of Genesis, and, uh, and you have this guy named Jacob. And Jacob's had a, had a long few years, and it's all kind of coming to a boiling point. And, and, and the next day, uh, Jacob's about to do something really big, something really important is about to happen, and his life is on the line. And he's confused, and he's mad at God. He's scared. And he finds himself um, by a river. He's at the edge of a river, and he's by himself, and he's just sitting there. And tomorrow is going to be a big day, but, but tonight is going to be a long night because he's waiting for what God is going to do. He's confused, he's angry, he's hurt, he's scared. And he's sitting there by the river. And then we don't have a lot of, of detail in the passage about what exactly happens, but it just says that then God wrestled with Jacob all night. And there, there's some creative room in there. I like to imagine that Jacob's sitting there and he's angry and he's, and he's, he's mad at God and then God comes out of the bushes and just <laughs> punches him. Probably not. But, but we don't know exactly what happened. But God wrestles Jacob. God wrestles Jacob and they wrestle all night. And we have this image of Jacob being frustrated, Jacob being confused, and then God meeting him there in the midst of that. Now, is God trying to prove himself? No. God, God can beat Jacob up. Is God trying to show off? No. God is, God is doing something here with Jacob. He's meeting Jacob in the midst of his confusion, in the midst of his hurt. But what we see in this passage, what I find is so interesting, is Jacob won't let go of God. He won't give up. And I think this is what God wants. I think God is trying to show Jacob something. And, and, and near the end of this wrestling match, the sun's about to come up and God says, okay, we're done. And Jacob says, no, I won't let you go. And God says, we're done. And Jacob says, no, I won't let you go. And by the end of it, he's holding on to God. And then God finally says, okay, I will bless you. And I really believe this is a picture of what God desires in our hurt in our confusion, to stay engaged with God, to cling to him, to not give up. There's this phrase that, that the night is darkest before dawn. And God waits until the last minute. He waits to see if Jacob is going to hold on. And then finally, at the very end, after Jacob is, has held on for all this time, he says, okay, I'm going to bless you. It's because God is doing something in the midst of that struggle. He's showing Jacob something. Jacob is forever changed after, the, after that wrestling match. Spiritually, he's changed, but also physically, he's changed. God takes his hip and puts it out of socket. He has a limp for the rest of his life. That moment changes him, spiritually and physically. There's a similar passage in, in the book of Job, where Job is mad with God. God has taken everything away from him. And, and Job knows that God has allowed everything to be taken from him. And, and he's crying out to God. And we have, we have 30 long chapters in the book of Job where God is silent. Again, this idea where, where night is darkest before the dawn. Job is crying out to God. He's throwing all of his anger and his emotions at God. And the passage makes sure to say that in everything that Job did, he was righteous. Job didn't cross any lines here. He brought how he was really feeling to God. God can take it. But then at the very end of Job, God says, okay, now I'm going to speak. Brace yourself. And then God speaks. In that wrestling match, as Job is clinging to God, as Job won't let God go, finally God speaks and shows Job what's really going on. And it changes him for the better. 
We have to be willing to hold on to God in our times of hurt. And the blessing will come. We see that in the next part of this passage. So as the psalm continues, it's been a long and painful process so far. It's only been nine verses. But we've seen the author crying out to God and God isn't answering. But then something happens, something turns here. Finally, after holding on to God, after sticking with it in the midst of pain and suffering, the author has this turning point that we've been waiting for. And it says this in verse 10. Then I thought to this I will appeal. The years when the Most High stretched out his right hand. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will consider all your works and meditate on all your mighty deeds. Your ways, God, are holy. What God is as great as our God? You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. With your mighty arm, you redeemed your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. We have this turning point here. Major shift in tone. The first nine verses, it's all sadness and confusion and despair. But now all of a sudden we see joy. We see hope. How do you get from that place of being completely lost, so hurt, so confused that you're questioning whether or not God even remembers you or loves you, whether or not God will keep his promises? The author is questioning these, these, these core important parts of who God is, a promise keeper. How do you get from that level of despair to, to hope, to joy, like real joy? We have the imagery in, in, in verse 2 of the author stretching out their hands to God. The image of the author's hands reaching out, unable to find comfort. But then at the turning point here in verse 10, we have a different image. Did you see that in verse 10? It says, Then I thought to this I will appeal, the years when the Most High stretched out his right hand. Again, the, the imagery of the hands, but it's not the hands of the author now. It's the hands of God. And then that passage closes in 15. With your mighty arm, you redeemed your people. So the image is the same, but it's a little different. Instead of focusing on the author's inability to fix a situation, it shifts to God's hand and God's strength. I can't cure cancer, but God can. I can't soften someone's heart, but God can. And we have this shift from what, what I am unable to do, switching over to looking at what God is able to do. And that is what causes this shift with the author, and it's beautiful, and I love this psalm because of it. When I was uh, thinking about what lament psalm to cover, I, this is the one that I, that I immediately went to because I, I, I love this psalm because of the message there. And I used to teach on this at, uh, at, at high school events a lot. I'd use Psalm 77, and I'd use this story, and, and I'd point out the imagery of, of the author reaching out their hand and then God reaching out his hand. And I think that that's a beautiful message here. But, but as I was putting this together and as I was kind of praying through this, um, a passage at the very end stood out to me. And, and I want to finish the psalm because there's something else here. And, and, and I love the idea that, that God's hand is able, that we can't. Our hand is weak, but God's hand is strong. And I think that message in itself is good, but, but there's more to it than that. Because we have nine verses in which the author is crying out to God and God doesn't answer. And that's the part where we get stuck, right? We all know that God can do the impossible. We all hope that God does the impossible. But oftentimes we're stuck there in verse 9, saying, God, where are you? Before that shift, before he comes through. Before the sun rises, we're stuck in that moment and it seems like an eternity where we're hurting and God is nowhere to be found. And it's awesome to say God can do it. It's awesome to look at scripture and look at the ways in which God has performed miracles. But sometimes that, that doesn't really matter because I'm hurting and God seems silent. What do we do in that? C.S. Lewis is, uh, is one of my favorite authors he writes a lot of good books. Um, he's got great theology, and then also he's just very creative, so he has good, like, fiction stories. C.S. Lewis, though, he, he has this quote that I want to read. Again, really strong Christian, amazing theologian, but in his grief, he writes this. And, and, and I've always found this to be profound. He says this, Meanwhile, where is God? This is one of the most disquieting symptoms. When you are happy... So happy that you have no sense of needing him. So happy that you are tempted to feel his claims upon you as an interruption. 
If you remember yourself and turn to him with gratitude and praise, you will be, or so it feels, welcomed with open arms. But go to him when your need is desperate, when all other help is vain, and what do you find? A door slammed in your face and the sound of bolting and double bolting on the inside. After that, silence. You may as well turn away. The longer you wait, the more emphatic that silence will become. There are no lights in the windows. It might be an empty house. Was it ever inhabited? It seems so once, and that seeming was as strong as this. What can this mean? Why is he so present a commander in our time of prosperity and so very absent a help in our time of trouble? C.S. Lewis had just lost his wife. And he was dealing with this grief. He, he writes a whole book on grief. And this is out of that book. And he's saying, God, when I need you most, why are you silent? This is a very important question as Christians. In our time of greatest hurt, why does it seem at times that God has abandoned us? Where is God in the midst of our hurting? The author closes this psalm with a story about the Israelites crossing through the Red Sea. And so I want to read that. And, and the author says something really important here. So at verse 16, I want to finish the psalm that says this, The waters saw you, God. The waters saw you and writhed. The very depths were convulsed. The clouds poured down water. The heavens resounded with thunder. Your arrows flashed back and forth. Your thunder was heard in the whirlwind. Your lightning lit up the world. The earth trembled and quaked. Your path led through the sea, your way through the mighty waters, though your footprints were not seen. The author really plays up the imagery here. There's lightning, there's a storm, there's rain. And in the midst of this, the Israelites are crossing through the Red Sea, so on both sides there's a wall of water. Now in the Old Testament, the author will often use water as a symbol of death. Flooding was common back then, storms were common, these were big causes of death. A lot of people couldn't swim, so the idea of being at sea in a storm meant you're, you're probably going to die. And so you have all this imagery of, of death and fear, lightning and thunder and rain and the water coming up. And in the midst of this, we know in the story that the, the Egyptian army, the greatest army in the world at the time, and their chariots are right on the Israelites' heels. So they're in the midst of the sea, and an army's right behind them. And the author makes a point to say, your footprints were not seen. So in the midst of, of this moment of great terror for Israel, death is literally all around them. And it's been a long time coming too. They've been fleeing from Egypt for some time now. And they're kind of out of the frying pan into the fire. Death is all around them and then God's footprints are nowhere to be seen. The author is intentional by putting that there. Even though we just had this moment of, of turning where we say, yeah, God can do it and God will do it again. I love that. That's a great message. But still, the question remains, where is God in the midst of our greatest moments of hurt? I know we've all been there, hurting. God, why would you allow me to experience this? Where is God in the midst of that? The Israelites have this moment that we see that close out the psalm. And Jesus has a moment too. And I want to I go, go to the cross really quickly. And Jesus on his cross... As he's dying, he quotes Psalm 22, and he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why does Jesus say that? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In Jesus' darkest moment, really the darkest moment in human history, he cries out to God and said, Why have you forsaken me? Even Jesus feels abandoned by God in his most painful moment. Now, from a theological perspective, Jesus is not mistaken here. As he's on the cross, he is covered in our sin. There's something important happening there. There's something really spiritual happening in which all of our sin is being placed on the perfect sacrifice. The Israelites, on the Day of Atonement, they have the, the sacrificial goat, and then they have the scapegoat. There are two goats. And the sacrificial goat is, is sacrifice, and then its blood cleanses the altar. But the scapegoat, and this is where we get the term scapegoat, all of the sins of Israel are put on this goat and then the priest leads it out of the camp and, and sends it out in the wilderness to die. And that goat carries the sins of the Israelites. Now, Jesus on the cross, he's being the ultimate scapegoat. He is taking on the sins, not of just the Israelites that year, 
like the Day of Atonement work, but he's taking on the sins of all of us for all time. All the sins that, that you and I have ever committed, our sins, they're in that moment on Jesus. And what that does, because God is a holy God, it separates God's divinity in that moment. For the first time ever, Jesus, and I know it's kind of confusing because Jesus is God and you got the whole Trinity thing, but in that moment, Jesus feels that separation between him and his heavenly Father. And that's when he cries out as he's covered in sin, as he's separated from his Father. That's when he cries out and says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we have those moments too, where in our hurt, we feel like God has completely abandoned us. And it feels like an eternity. But what I love about the story of the Red Sea, what I love about Jesus' story, is that when we zoom out, we can see and in these moments of great hurt and great suffering, God is ever present. In fact, these are the greatest miracles we see in Scripture. God's saving the Israelites from the, the strongest army of all time, parting a Red Sea. Now, in the midst of that, the Israelites are saying, God, where are you? We're about to die. But we see that suffering is part of God's greatest act of saving in the Old Testament. And then God tops it in the New Testament. We see Jesus in his greatest moment of suffering and feeling like he's abandoned by God entirely. When we zoom out, God is in the process of doing the greatest miracle of all time, his greatest act of saving. Now, in both of these situations, it feels like God is absent, but God is there. I have a, I, I foster, and my, my oldest son, we're fostering him, and uh, I don't get to talk about him very much because we can't legally talk about him um, until he's adopted. And uh, pretty early on, um, they told us when we got him that, uh, that we could, that it was pretty much a shoe in for adoption. So my wife and I were pretty excited, and we got this four-month-year-old little boy, and, uh, and we were very excited because we, we, we were told, hey, you're going to adopt him. The parents are out of the picture. And so about a year goes by, and we're raising this little boy as our own. And then we get a call from the social worker saying, hey, um, the aunt is, is fighting for custody now and is preparing her home, and there's going to be a, a visit with the judge, and they're going to determine whether or not you get to keep him in your home. And this was really scary for us because we had raised this kid for a year now and, um, and he felt like our kid. And now someone's saying, hey, we might take him out of your house. That was scary. And I remember um, one evening, I've shared this with some of, the, some of the men before at our men's retreat, but um, I remember one evening, it was actually the night before court, I was putting him to bed and, uh, and I knew this could be my last night with him. And I was holding him and he fell asleep in my hands and I remember wrestling with God in that moment, saying, God, how could you let this happen? How could you put me in this position? How could you allow me to fall in love with this little boy? And I knew holding him as he was sleeping there, this could be my last night with him. And in those moments, we say, God, where are you? God, how could you allow this to happen? But the day came and went, and, and the judge didn't rule in the favor of the mom. And, and I'm not rooting against his biological family, but I was praising God that I didn't lose my son. And now we're getting close, and, and, and the court is saying, hey, all you need is the birth certificate, and then you can adopt him. And so all they need to do is print this piece of paper, and, and, and they're saying he's yours. It's a wonderful thing. But man, it came with some hurt. It's the greatest miracle I've seen God do, do in our lives. Places this perfect little boy in our house. It's perfect most of the time. He placed this boy in our house, but man, it came with some of the greatest hurt I've ever experienced. And I think God wants us to know that he just wants us to stick with him, to trust that he is doing something big because God's greatest miracles come with some of the greatest moments of hurt. We just have to trust him. If we could zoom out and see the other side, we'd have faith and we'd know that God is doing something good. But oftentimes we get stuck in that one hour before sunrise. We get stuck in that pain and we say, God, where are you? If only we knew that he was doing something bigger. If only we could trust that he was in control. I want to close with Psalm 22. I want to invite the team up. Psalm 22, this is what Jesus uh, quotes when he's on the cross. 
And he quotes the beginning of the psalm. He doesn't read all of it, but I want to read um, a big portion of it this morning as we close in worship. In Psalm 22, it says this, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer by night, but I find no rest. And the passage continues. I want to skip down to verse 15. And again, this is, this is what Jesus quotes when he's on the cross, as he's at his lowest moment. And he says this in Psalm twenty-two, fifteen: 15, My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircle me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garments. But you, Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel, for he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. I want to invite you to stand for this last part that I read, because this is where it gets really good. And we're going to take this into worship. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nation will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord. And he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive, posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. Let's worship, church.